All right, good morning. Our uh, uh, passage this morning, we're going to read here quickly, is in Romans chapter 6. We're going to start in Romans chapter 6 and read 1 through 11. So read along with me as we read this uh, from the book of Romans. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, and we just pray this morning that you will prepare our hearts to hear what you would have us to hear from your word, this great passage in Romans 6 about our identification with Christ. We just pray that your Holy Spirit will have free reign here to help us to learn what you would have us to learn today. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. It's good to be with you again and getting the opportunity to come up here and bring God's word to you. I will ask if you don't mind, pray for me a little bit. I've had this chest cold for two and a half weeks now and it just won't let go. Um, So uh, forgive me in advance if I turn and cough. (laughs) uh, So just pray that we can get through that. Uh, Okay, and I appreciate that. So if someone were to come up to you and ask you how they could be saved... We would immediately take them to scripture, right? Each one of us, we would immediately go to verses like John 3.16 or Ephesians 2.8 and 9 or Acts 16.31 where the Philippian jailer said to the apostle, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and all your household. We're good at that. We would be ready to give them chapter and verse to show them from scripture how to be saved and this is good we should be able to do that and these are important verses that we all know because maybe these were the verses that brought you to salvation or led you to salvation so we should be able to do that and most of us can if we were to lead somebody to the lord we can take them chapter and verse to those to those verses because it impacted us and it tells us about uh, our lives and it showed where we Uh, these verses impacted us. What's ironic is that if someone comes to us, us and asks us how to live the Christian life and how to overcome and have victory over sin, we tend not to be as ready for that question. We don't know what verses to show them, and we're not as ready to show them how to live. And what do we tell somebody who asks, well, how do I overcome the struggle with sin? And a lot of times we tend to go, oh, I got that. I read a good book the other day. Or, hey, there was this great article on the Internet that I read. Or we talk about all kinds of different things. Maybe there's a checklist. We talk about a book we've read. Um, Different tricks we use to overcome sin in our lives. Maybe you have a list of here's the 12 dirty things to not do. And here's the 12 good things to do. Just follow those check marks and you'll be fine. And you can think of a million different ways that we try to, indeed, try to deal with particular sins in our lives. And, you know, I'm sure in your own mind you're thinking about some of those things right. So the question, though, is how can we live the Christian life? How can we live free from the power of sin? Well, 
the answers to all of those struggles are in the passage that we just read right here in Romans chapter 6. Our own solution to sin in our lives will always lead to failure. If we're going to be successful in our struggle with sin, in the sin nature, we've got to rely on God's way of doing it. We've got to rely on his way of dealing and his solutions to the problems of sin in our lives. When God saved us, he delivered us from the penalty of sin. And I think we all agree with that, no doubt. We all definitely agree that when we are saved, he saved us from the penalty of sin. And that's great news for the unbeliever, is that we're saved from the penalty of sin. But you know, there's still good news for the believer as well. He also saved us from the power of sin in our lives, and he has arranged the means for us to be delivered from the power of sin And eventually, someday, we'll actually be freed from the very presence of sin when we're glorified. We look forward to that day. So you may remember when we talked last year um, about salvation. uh, And um, salvation, God's plan for salvation involves a whole lot more than just saving us from the penalty of sin. There's a bunch more to it than that. And I've got this... um, uh, graph up here. I think it, uh, it should be up there. Yes. Okay, great. It's up there now. And really, I wanted to review this, and I'm going to thank Tom Constable for these notes. Uh, these are his notes here. So this is a visual representation of the Christian life. And you see down there in that bottom left-hand corner is that when a, experience, when a, when a sinner experiences redemption, He is immediately made positionally right with God. So you see that up arrow. Okay, at the moment of redemption, you're made perfect legally and right with God. You're positionally right with God. You have legal standing, and that is something that is yours forever. And at the moment of salvation, you are made positionally right with God, but then you begin a process of what's called practical or progressive sanctification that takes place over time. This process is us, a process of us becoming more and more holy. And as you see, as represented by the graph there, it takes place over time. And eventually, our, we're going to end up in glorification. So just because you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, though, it does not automatically automatically guarantee that you're going to make progress in your spiritual maturity. And that's represented by the ups and downs of the, uh, of the chart there. You're going to have good days and bad days, but hopefully the overall progression is to become more and more like Christ every day. So that is, um, <clears throat> so we hope that the, the trajectory is generally up. Now the walk of the believer, it involves growth. And it requires the believer to cooperate with God in order to produce holiness in our daily lives. And the good news here is that God leads the believer and he provides the enablement for us to follow him as well. So he not only leads us, he provides the enablement. But you know what? We as believers, we've got to choose to follow. And we must make use of the resources that God has provided for us in our sanctified life. Our progressive sanctification, it ends at death. And you can see the death or the rapture, that last section there to the right. Um, Your sanctification will continue in your life until your condition finally conforms to your legal standing before God. So that will continue until either you die or we are raptured. Okay, And there is going to be a generation of believers who are raptured and never have to die. At that moment, then you will be completely righteous in your experience in addition to having been declared righteous. So see here at the left, we're declared righteous immediately. So that is our legal standing before God is that we are righteous. But our experience is that we still experience sin. And that's the process of progressive sanctification where we eventually will be glorified at death or the rapture. So justification and glorification are automatic. Upon belief, you possess both of those. Your standing before God is that you are right before God and that you will be glorified before God. 
And sanctification is a possibility, but it's not automatic. Okay, we have to cooperate with God in our daily walk yeah, with him. So there's two lessons that we can learn from this. Number one, I cannot save myself. I need a deliverer. Okay, one who can save me from the penalty of sin. And that's good news. If you're an unbeliever here, you have a deliverer in Jesus Christ. But there's also a second thing that we see here that we as believers, I cannot live the Christian life under my own power. I also need a deliverer to help me, save me from the power of indwelling sin. And Jesus Christ is that man. The good news for the believer is that the same man that delivered you from sin's penalty is the same one who's going to deliver you from sin's power. And this is done through our identification with Christ. And that's what we're going to see here in this passage. Now, I need to give you a little bit of background on the book of Romans and, you know, what Paul is saying and doing here. Uh, in chapters 1 through 321, Paul is, is talking about why people need salvation. He's laying out the case that every one of us needs a Savior. So in chapters 1 through 321, he talks about why people need a Savior. In chapters 3 through the end of chapter 5, he talks about what God has done to provide salvation. And then in chapters 6 through 8, which is where we are in chapter 6, he talks about how justified sinners can become more holy in their daily living before we are glorified. <clears throat> and this is done because of the believer's relationship. In chapter 6 through 8, he talks about the believer's relationship to sin, the believer's relationship to the law, and the believer's relationship to God. But our passage today is in 6 verses 1 through 11, and it talks about our relationship to sin. As believers, what, how do we relate to sin? I mean, what, what is it? How do we deal with that? And that's what we're going to see here. But if you look, I need to go back just a second to 5. If you look back in Romans 5 verses 20 and 21, Paul is finishing up his his argument on what God has done to provide for our salvation. And it says, And the law came in that the transgression might increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul anticipated in verse 6, okay, well, if grace covers sin, and sin increases, grace increases more, wouldn't it make sense that we should continue in sin? Paul anticipated that question. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? There's a criticism when you teach grace, <clears throat> that if you teach God's grace and that it covers sin, it will continue to cover sin, that somehow that will lead to carnality. And I think Paul anticipated that. And because if you understand grace in our human way of thinking, is that, hey, I can do whatever I want and still go to heaven. If, if I sin and grace increases, I'm just going to continue to do that. Uh, but here... We're going to teach God's grace unapologetically because you know why? Grace is the only solution to the penalty of sin. God's grace is the only solution to the penalty of sin. And it's the only solution to the power and presence of sin in the believer. Grace is God's solution to every problem that you're going to face as it relates to sin. Okay? God's grace is the solution to it. And I think Paul anticipated that. If you see back in verse 3, chapter 3, verse 8, he say, and, so, and why not say, as some are slanderous reported and some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. That's man's reasoning. Let's just do evil. Well, that's the way God set it up. Let's do evil that good may come. He says their condemnation is just. Okay, don't think that way. So two points to take into consideration here. Starting in verse 520, you don't see this in the English, but the word sin is, is used with the Greek article, the. It's articulated. It's set apart. 
So you might read it in the law. I mean, read it here. It says, but where the sin increased. And then he goes back and he says, now shall we continue? Verse, two, uh, verse one, he says, are we to continue in the sin that grace might increase? Why do you think Paul's doing that? He's articulating the sin and making it a singular. Is he talking about the sin in my life? That, oh no, he's discovered the sin that I do that hinders me? Or is he talking about a certain type of sin? Or is he talking about a certain consistency of sin? So many times we as believers, when we look at sin in our lives, we focus on particular acts of sin. We try to focus on particular sinful tendencies that we have or habits and things that we have, and we deal with those and say, you know what? If I can get that one under control, I'm going to be good, okay? I'll be back in fellowship if I just get that sin taken care of. Well, I think what Paul is referring to when he articulates the sin is he's referring to the source of sin, the root of sin in our lives and the sin nature. This is all sin in word, thought, or deed that originates here in the sin nature. Romans 7, 17 says, so, now longer, so no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which indwells me. He's talking about sin as a disposition here. A singular sin that is attached to your fleshly body. And whether you like it or not, that sin is going to be with you until the day that we're glorified before God. Okay? And another observation here that we need to take in consideration is look at what he says in verse 6, or 6 verse 1. He says, shall we continue in sin? Or shall we continue in sin that the grace might increase? This is not, shall we continue to sin? He's saying, shall we continue in sin? So Paul here is not talking about particular acts of sin. He's talking about the source of sin in your life. He's talking about the source or the root of sin. And Paul is for, focused here not on particular acts of sin or particular tendencies he has. He's focused on the very root and the nature of where sin comes from. Right from the start, Paul is looking at this differently from how we tend to see things. We look at particular sins and think that if we can get that one under control, I'll be good. If you want to put the next slide up, Bob, we'll kind of get a picture of this um, and what Paul is talking about here. And we tend to think of the tree as acts of sin, okay? We think of above the ground here, all right? And what we try to do as believers is we go around and say, oh, I'm going to deal with this particular sin, and we go around chopping the fruit off the tree, okay? And we go, oh, I'm going to get serious about this. Maybe I'll take two of those fruits off the tree. But you know what we ended up doing? We run around all the time, and we're always chopping the fruit off the tree. And guess what? It grows back. It comes back. And the world's solution, and often ours, is to just run around chopping fruit off the tree, hoping that we're going to take care of a particular sin in our lives. So maybe you have anger problems, and your solution is to do yoga. I don't know, just making things up here. You know, uh, you have anger problems. You say, whenever I get angry, I'm just going to go do yoga or watch the Hallmark Channel. I don't know, but uh, you'll have some sort of particular uh, solution. Maybe you have lust problems. Maybe you have any issues with uh, going to places on the Internet you shouldn't go. So let's just put an Internet filter on. That'll take care of it. Well, guess what? You still got the lust problem. Okay? The Internet filter didn't take care of it. Maybe you cheat on exams and you say, okay, what I'm going to do, I have a tendency towards cheating. I'm just going to wear blinders when I go in to take an exam. Well, guess what? That doesn't take care of the issue. You're just picking off fruit, and it's going to continue uh, to uh, give you problems. See, the problem is the root of sin, what's below the ground that still remains, and we need to deal with the root of sin, or as Paul says here, is the sin. Shall we continue in the sin or the root of sin?
You want to put up the next slide? I got a picture here um, of um, that's my backyard. That was from about 10 years ago. I don't know if you remember that ice storm that came in uh, mid-December about 10 years ago. Well, that was the end result <laughs> in our backyard. We had three big trees, and the ice came, and it blew up. Our trees literally exploded and fell to the ground, and that was the end result. So I looked at that, and I was thinking about that because... Ginger and I and the boys and the girls, we spent hours and hours and hours cutting those trees down to this very stump because that's how much they were broke, broken. And we took it and we put all those branches out on the curb. Well, come about March, guess what happened? All those trees started sprouting up again. They were literally cut off at the, root, at the base and those trees still started sprouting again. And you know why it was? Because the root system was still in place. And I, I tried my best to stop those trees from growing. And I kid you not, for three years, those things kept popping back up. Am I right? Yeah. Those things kept coming back up. Alex would go out and try to stop those things. I said, will you go out there and chop those little the trees down? Uh, and it would come up, you know, in different parts of the yard. Well, it's because the root system was still there. And the cause and the life of those trees was still there. And it wasn't until we took care of the root system that, that thing, those things stopped. And it took a long time. Well, the good news is that God has an answer for the source of sin in our lives. And this is what Paul is going to develop here in this chapter. So we need to be reliant on God's way of dealing with sin in our lives and not on our creative means to deal with it. He wants us to trust him and his plan to deal with sin. And if you look at what it says here, shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? That word continue is a form of the word translated abide. And it means to remain in addition or to abide in or at a place. So Paul is saying, shall we continue abiding in this sin nature and to live under its control so that God's grace can abound even more? He's saying, should you continue to live this way? This is human viewpoint thinking. This is a rhetorical question. Should you continue? You know, I, I, as I looked at this, there were some quotes that were pretty fantastic. One of the guys says, I like to sin. God likes to forgive sin. Well, really, the world is rather admirably arranged. Okay? That's the human way of thinking. And Paul is saying in verse 2, may it never be. Don't think that way. That's not how it should be. He says, may it never come into existence. By no means. Of course not. God forbid. No, no. What a ghastly thought. Don't think that way. Paul's reason for being so emphatic is, has nothing to do with what you and I typically think the reasons what people would give for not sinning in one's life. Just think about in your own mind. What are some reasons you don't want to sin? Well, sin's bad for you. Okay, yeah, of course it is. Well, sin's not good for your health. There are times when you can participate in sins that have negative health consequences. It's true. Well, you might go to prison. I always tell my kids when they turn 18, you're eligible to go to prison for life now, so behave yourself. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so you might go to prison, okay? It might cause you to lose reward if you sin. And last week when Jason taught, he mentioned that uh, we're going to rule and reign with Christ and his coming kingdom. Well, our lives today are, and how we live our lives today and have a, has a big impact on how we're going to rule and reign in the kingdom. So sure, don't sin because it will impact your future uh, role in the millennial kingdom. So those are all true. Everything we just talked about here is true, and those are good reasons not to sin, but that's not the reason Paul gives here. We, if you read it closely, what shall we say, or may it never be, how shall we who have died to sin still live in it? We as believers have died to the sin, to the source of sin. When we became a believer, we died to sin Sin didn't die. We did. 
We can, and we can experience freedom from sin in the Christian life from what we learn right here in Romans chapter 6. We have died to sin. Now, we will always fail when we try to overcome sin in our own power, and the Lord wants to be our help. And that passage, this is what he's talking about here in this passage. So this is a positional truth that we need to understand and know. As believers, you and I have died. In Greek, that's the aorist tense, which is the past tense. It, this is something we have died, and it happened at a specific point in time in the past. And what did we die? We died to the sin. So we need to understand this truth as believers. This is a very, very important for us to understand as believers, is that we die to sin, and it happened to you by the actions of someone else. <clears throat> Whether you know it or not, at the moment that you become a believer, you have already died to the sin nature. You have died or to the source of sin in your life. When the Bible speaks of death, it's always a separation. It's not an extinction. Death is separation. And death to sin is a separation from sin's power, and it's not an extinction of sin. So when we die, our bodies, when we die, our soul separates and our soul goes to God and our body goes into the ground. So that's just a separation. It's not an extinction. You still exist. You just exist separate from your body. And Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Well, Adam and Eve lived for hundreds of years longer. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, they died spiritually. They were separated from God at that very moment. So when we talk about death, we need to think of it not as an extinction, but as a separation. So God has severed the automatic domination of sin in your life so that you don't need to be dominated by it any longer. And this is good news for the believers. This is good news for me. It's good news for you, okay? And this is not about feelings or it's something you need to know. <clears throat> it's a positional truth that you need to know and trust by faith. So really what this is, is Paul is asking a rhetorical question. He says, since we have already died to the sin nature, why should we live any longer in it or under its control? God has removed you from the position of being under the control of sin. Why do you want to remain in it? You're removed from the control of position. When we die to sin, we were identified with Christ. <clears throat> when he died, we died with him. <clears throat> it's already done. And we don't need to beg for it. We don't need to ask for it. At the moment of belief, it was done in your life. And that's a biblical, factual truth that we need to know. And we need to trust him by faith that this is true of us. So he goes on here in verse 3. It says, or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? So he starts here in verse 3, and he'll go in verse 6, and then also verse 9. He's going to talk about some things that we as believers need to know. Um, so Paul here is making the assumption that the believers he is writing to know that they were baptized into Jesus Christ. And Paul shows here that the, we died to sin at the moment we are baptized into Christ when we believed. Now, baptism, we typically think of, when we think of baptism, we think of water and being dunked, okay? That's ritual baptism, and that is an aspect of baptism. Um, but here what Paul is talking about baptism, he's using it in terms of identification um, and how we are identified. So baptism in this particular instance means being we, we have believed as believers, we have been placed into Christ, identified with him and placed into union with Jesus Christ. So we were taken into death with Christ and we need to rely upon our death with Jesus Christ and again, as I said before, this is not something we need to strive for. It's done. We need to rest in the fact that we did die with Christ. So what Paul is talking about here is real baptism or actual baptism. And it's a picture of when God took me out of Adam, 
At the moment of salvation, he took me out of Adam and placed me into Jesus Christ. And that all happened at the moment of Jesus Christ. It's not something we experience. I didn't have a feeling when that happened, but it is something that actually happened, and we only know it here because God teaches it through his word. So we need to know that, okay? So it happened at the moment we believed in the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So God placed us, he baptized us, or he identified us with Christ. And the same group that was baptized into the same group is the very same group that was baptized into his death. That's you and me. Okay? In verse 4, he says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. Since it was true, and what, this is what Paul is saying here, since it was true that we were baptized or identified with Christ into his death, we were also buried with him through this baptism or identification. So when we talk about burial, burial happens because a death has taken place. And so the reason that you were buried with Christ is that you have also died with him. So this burial, so we were buried, and for this, so that, and you see there at the, after the comma, baptism into his death, so that, and this is the purpose for which we are identified with Christ. Why did God do this? Why did he baptize? There's a very practical reason for him for doing this. And the end goal was we were buried with him so that we might be raised with him. Okay? We not only were buried, we were also raised with Christ. And it is so that as, in the same manner, so what, what, what this is teaching us is that as Christ was buried, we in the same manner were buried with him. And so that as Christ was raised from the dead through God's glory, God's purposes, so are we raised as well. Okay? So as Christ was, so we are. Okay? And for the purpose of what? that we might walk in newness of life. What is this newness of life? What does that mean? Well, it's just what we've been talking about. It's not being dominated by sin. Paul, because we are identified with Christ, is teaching us that this newness of life, we don't have to be dominated by sin. We don't have to abide in sin. And this is a new way for we as believers to live in freedom for the believers. And Paul goes on in verse 5, and you see the word for there, which is basically means he's carrying on his argument. He continues to, to, to carry on his argument here. He says, an indication of Paul's building upon God's purposes for identifying us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And it says, for if we have become united with him, and that is a first-class conditional. It's not if, like maybe we did, maybe we didn't. It's if we have become united with him, and we have... That's what that means, and we have. Because the believer has been identified with the Christ in his death, the believer has also been identified with him in his resurrection as well. It says we have become, that's in the perfect tense. That means it's a completed action with ongoing results. We have become united. This is an agricultural term. We don't see it as much in the English, but it's an agricultural term, which means planted or fused together with a similarity of experience with him. And we have been planted and united with him in his death, and we remain united with him. I don't know if you've ever seen those trees where maybe two trees come together, and they come together, and eventually they grow together, and you cannot separate them. You know, you look at that, and they can become fused over time, and that growth is just solid. There's no way to get them apart. Um, that's what Paul is saying here, is that we are united with Christ or fused together with him, and we remain that way with him. This is a great verse for eternal security. You know, we are fused together with him, and there's nothing that's going to separate us. And likeness means resemblance. It's the same way. It's it, that word where we are, we are fused together with him in the likeness of his death. It's the same way that two, it's being used here that 
to say that two people may resemble one another even though they are no way related. So what this is saying is that Christ's death was representative. It's not based upon feeling. Jesus Christ took you with him. You didn't feel it, but you are still related to him in what he went through. And he wants you to be assured of that fact. And then he says, certainly, if we have been united with him, and we have, in his likeness of his death, certainly we shall be like him in the likeness of his resurrection. That word, since we know that we're united in the likeness of his death, most assuredly you are united with him in his resurrection. You are inseparably, you and I as believers are in inseparable union with our Savior forever. And this is a fact, regardless of your circumstances or your feelings or whether you've had a good day or a bad day, when you're a believer, you are inseparably united with your Savior. Isn't that good news? Amen? There's nothing we can do to separate us from that. This is your position in Christ. It is a work of God, and we should all be comforted by that very fact. Something we need to know. All right. This is the life that the believer is now designed to walk in. <clears throat> what did verse 2 say? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? We were not designed as Christians, as believers, Saved, we were not designed to live in sin. God forbid, certainly not. No, that's not how we should live. Why you should live in sin? Why should you live in sin when God has done so much to get you out of it? And He has. Why do we want to live any other way? God has fully equipped and resourced us to walk in this newness of life. And God strongly desi desires this, and he's put all the resources into place for us to live this way. However, it's not guaranteed. It requires human volitional choice in order to benefit from what God has done. It must be done by means of faith. In other words, we need to believe what God is teaching us here. We need to trust that what he said is true. Hebrews 11, 6, you know, without faith it is impossible to please God. Okay, well, that's what this part of what is a reference to. We, in our walk with the walk as believers, must have faith that what God's word says is true. This is true of us. Ephesians 2, 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. But I say to you, in Galatians 5, 16 through 18, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Titus 3, 8 says, this is a trustworthy statement and concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good works or good deeds. These are good and profitable for men. We should do these things. We should do good works. It's God's desire for our lives. Okay, He wants us, but we need to respond by faith. We need to accept as true what God has said, which is faith. Okay, so God has done his part and he's given us everything we need, but we need to do our part and we need to rely upon God's solutions and trust him for the solution to sin in our lives. So we get to that next thing in verse six, another thing that we need to, to know. It says, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So this is another thing we need to know. We need to be taught. And again, Paul reminds us three times of some things we need to know in this chapter. Most days, you're not going to feel like this. Okay, But we need to know that 
God has done this for us. God wants us to know that another reason he identified us with Christ was to crucify our old man. And he wants us to know that our old self was crucified with him. It was one and done. It was executed. Crucified. What was crucifixion? It was an execution, right? Okay. It's one and done. It's executed. The person you were in Adam has been executed, done away with. So who is the old self? It's our identity in Adam. That's who the old self is. It's who you were as a believer, who you were before salvation. You were in Adam. Your old identity was in Adam. But when you got saved, at the moment you got saved, you were placed into Christ, and Adam is no longer. And we need to understand that as believers. It's gone. What you were in Adam was crucified with Christ, and that identity no longer exists. The old Adam is no longer in existence in the mind of God. So when God looks at you as a believer, he doesn't see the old Adam. He sees who? His son, Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20, Paul knew this. He understood this when he said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And because of this, there's no believer who is currently related to or identified with Adam. You are a new person in Christ. You're identified with Christ. First, Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, and we see from here that we are, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all thing, the new things have come. <clears throat> this is something we need to understand, something we need to know. Because until we know this, until we grasp this, we're going to try to use every tactic under the sun to beat sin. And guess what? Every time you're going to be unsuccessful. So, one point of distinction here. The old self, Adam, is to be distinguished from our old nature or the sin nature. They're not the same thing. Those are two different things. The old Adam and the sin nature. What Paul is speaking of here is the old self. Who we were in Adam, and he's referring to our, our identity in Adam. And that old self in Adam no longer exists once we have been justified. The old nature, the old sin nature, the source of sin which dwells our human body, guess what? That's still there after justification, unfortunately. But here's the important point, and this is what Paul's point here is. It says, because of our co-crucifixion with Christ, our relationship to the sin nature has changed. Our relationship to the sin nature has changed. It changes forever after we are saved. We don't have to sin anymore. When we were in Adam, we had no choice. We could only do what the nature of Adam required of us. We sinned. So many times we don't feel like this, but the day that you got saved, this relationship to sin changed. And we must learn to take advantage of what God has given us in order to deal with that. Our old identity in Adam was crucified. The person you were born to be in Adam is no longer. And this is an event, like we said, has already taken place. It's not something we're commanded to seek or to do. It's already done. The crucifixion of the old self is not a command to obey. It's a fact to rely upon. It's something we need to rely upon this. So, as believers, we don't have to deal with our old man, our old identity in Adam. God has dealt with him. That's done. <clears throat> and we need to understand this. If we do, it's going to change our walk and our sanctification with the Lord. You don't need to get up every morning and duke it out with the old self. You're dead to the old self. And sanctification is not about improving the old self, and God is not trying to improve the old self. He crucified it. So co-crucifixion with Christ has already taken place. The believer just needs to daily rely upon this crucifixion with Christ and benefit from it. So why did God do this? We see the word that 
Um, and uh, in that, so knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So we see that word that. There's two purposes for what God has done here. He said that the body of sin or our sin nature or the source of sin in our bodies might be done away with or rendered powerless or put out of business. Okay? This is not an annihilation of the sin nature. It limits the sin nature while it's still present. So that's what God has done to it for us is he's limited the sin nature. It is still present. But because of our identification with Christ, the relationship to that sin, to the believers, is the same as Christ's relationship to sin. He had no part of it, okay? You're free from the ravages. There's no longer, I say, we are, there's no longer an automatic connection to the sin nature to dominate us any longer. You're free from the ravages of the sin nature. This automatic connection to you has been broken forever, we're no longer obligated or we no longer have necessary obligation to sin, to the sin nature. And purpose number two is that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Prior to salvation, when we were in Adam, our identity was in Adam, we didn't have any choice. Okay, But because of justification, you no longer have to be slaves from sin. You are delivered at the moment of salvation, you are delivered from slavery. Now, you can choose to stay in slavery, but you don't have to, okay? You don't have to. God has provided the way out of that. So if you want to put a, some, uh, put a business out of business, what do you do? You stop frequenting it, right? You just quit going, okay? And eventually, that business is going to go out of business because you are not being part of it. You're not supporting it. It's the same way with our sin nature. We need to stop frequenting the sin nature. We need to put sin out of business in our lives, and we need to be dead to it. You know why? Because we're alive unto God as believers. That is our positional truth, that we are alive unto God. So verse 7, do you need more proof that you have been freed from sin. Look what he says, for he who died is freed from sin. Why don't you have to be a slave? Well, it's because you've been freed. You have died to sin. And again, this is one of those things that's in the perfect tense. It's a completed action with ongoing benefits. You did die. It happened at a point in time, and you were freed from sin. So the literal translation might here might be, for he who has died has been justified or declared righteous away from the sin nature with the ongoing results of remaining justified away from the sin nature. <clears throat> and on the day you died, you were, you were delivered from the necessary obligation to the sin nature. Now, you say, well, wait a second. That sin nature still screams at me all the time, okay? Okay. You ever seen, uh, have you ever happened across one of those Nat Geo channels where you see all the guys in the jail and they're all in their cells and the guards walk down and what are those guys doing all the time? They're yelling at the guard, right? They're banging, they're making noise. Uh, but guess what? They're locked behind the bars. Well, our sin nature is that way too. It's locked behind the bars, but guess what? It's still yelling at you. It's saying, come over here. It's still there. And if you think about that, if those guards walked over to those uh, prisoners, what's going to happen? You're going to reach out and grab that guard. That's the way sin is in our life too. It's behind bars because of our new position in Christ, but it's still there yelling at us. But you know what? You don't have to give in to it because you are now in Christ. When you died, you were delivered from the necessary obligation to the sin nature. You don't have to give in to it. In verse 8 says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. The word now is a transition. And again, this is a first class conditional. We can read it. Now if we have died with Christ, and we have, we uh, you could put now since we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We have been identified with Christ in his death. And we will remain with identified with him forever. 
we will live with him into the future. But we can also live with him now. Okay? There are some theologians who say, well, this is talking about the future date uh, when we're, we're living in our glorified bodies uh, with Christ. And I think it could be that. But I think also in the context here is that we can live the abundant life now because of our new identity in Christ. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you may have it more abundantly. So as believers, as Christians, we can have the abundant life now in Jesus Christ. And verse 9 is the last of the knowing that it says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, and death no longer is master over him. Because again, this is another thing that Paul says that we need to know. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will die no more. Death has no dominion over him, and if Jesus died no more, so too will it be with we as believers once we are resurrected ourselves. Death no longer has dominion over him. He paid our debt in full. Amen. He paid it, and we were united with him. So this is true of us as well. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. This is the word for, again, this is further explanation that Paul. Christ's death was a once for all event. His death to sin accomplished the task that it was set out to do. Now, it's an important here, point here for me to just clarify very clearly here. Jesus Christ was never connected to the sin nature. He never was connected to the sin nature. He had no part of the sin nature, nor was he under the dominion of sin. Okay? Those things were not true of Jesus. But what we see here, for so the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. What we see this here is that he did this for us. He did this for you and for me as it relates to sin's power. He freed us from sin's power. And he did it for us on our behalf. So why would we try to free ourselves from sin when he's already done it for us? He's already done it all for us. So <clears throat> don't continue in sin. We don't have to. Christ lives continually as we should. So we should enjoy Jesus Christ without disruption. So what do we do with this knowledge? Verses 1 through 10, Paul has given us a lot of knowledge here, some things that we need to know. So here's a few things that we need to know. One, we must know of our identity with Christ. We are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, this is a concept that's really kind of hard to understand, okay? If we're all honest, even me, I, it's, this is hard for us to understand. But we must believe by faith that this is the teaching of Scripture, and that we actually died with Christ Somehow, some way, he took us back in time, and we actually died with Christ, and we were actually resurrected with him when he died, when he was crucified. And we also need to know that in this shared death and resurrection, he has broken the automatic domination of sin in our lives, and it has freed us from the slavery to sin. We no longer have to remain as slaves to sin because of the work that Jesus Christ has done for us. And that brings us to verse 11. And we'll finish up here. Paul's application in verse 11. We're going to stop here today. And it says, this is, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul, all the way through Romans here, has been talking about a lot of theological concepts. And this is his first imperative in the book. This is his first command. This is a very important verse for your Christian life. What do we do with all the information that he has given us in verses 1 through 10? And what we see here is that the same cross that saved us from the penalty of sin is the same cross that delivers believers from the obligation to the sin nature. The cross is what has delivered us, delivered us from the ravages of sin. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, it says, For the word... Of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. 
But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's us. It's talking about us who are being saved from the power of sin. The cross is the power of God. And then we look at that word, some of your, that word consider, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Some of your Bibles might say some other words. It might say reckon or count, okay? That is the Greek word logizomai, okay? And that is a command. And what Paul is saying is here is Count this to be a reality. You need to recount this to be a reality. And this is the same uh, word that he used in chapter 4 where God reckoned or counted righteousness to Abraham's account. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. It was a reality in Abraham's life. And so too, we need to take what God's word here and count it to be a reality in our lives. And that's a command. Count yourself to have died with Christ to sin. God, this is a commandment of God for you to be doing this. And really, this is the most basic beginning of the walk of the Christian life, isn't it? This goes back to what we mentioned at the very, very beginning where, uh, where people ask us questions about how to deal with sin. Here it is. This is the answer. For Christians... <clears throat> for Christian growth and struggles, you know, we typically stress in the Christian life a lot of other things. Maybe we should tithe. Maybe we should uh, go to church. Maybe we should hang with better people. Those are all our solutions. Those are fine, but here's the answer. We give a ton of things that we say we should do other than this one. And we should count yourself to have died with Christ to sin. We need to start with reckoning. <clears throat> Bob, if you want to put that chart up, again, we're going to look at this uh, very, very quickly here. If we don't understand this, this truth, we can possibly be flatline Christians. Okay, you see that line across the bottom there in man's sinfulness? If we don't reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ, you can remain a flatline Christian. And never grow in your faith. You can continue to struggle with sin in your life. And you can continue to be dead, to, to uh, never grow. So you don't want to be a flatline Christian. God doesn't want that for you. He wants us to glory in the freedom that we now have to serve him and glorify him without having to obey the sin nature. So you can reckon yourself to be dead to sin by believing what the scriptures teach about our identity in Christ. And God wants us to act upon this knowledge and he wants us to rely upon these truths by faith. And you can know this, but it doesn't do you any good until you rely upon it and put it into action. Okay. <clears throat> and we're going to end there. So what most of what we have looked at today has been for those who have already believed the good news of Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we praise God for that new identification in Christ. This is awesome for we as believers, okay? And this is for we as believers. But, you know, there may be some here today or watching online later or maybe who've stumbled across this video who have yet to place their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And if that describes you, I would urge you today to make today the day that you believe in Jesus Christ so that he can save you from your sins and change your identification so that you can be identified with Jesus Christ and can begin this new journey in your new identity in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your, the great truths of your word. We thank you that you have done so much work for us and on our behalf and help us to know these things, internalize these things, and live these truths out in our lives. We pray for all of those here who are believers that you would help them to see these truths, to trust these truths, and to uh, implement these in their daily walk. We thank you that we don't have to be slaves to sin, we don't have to sin, and that you have provided all the means to accomplish that. For any here who have not come to trust you, we pray that today will be the day 
that they come to believe in you as their Savior and begin this journey with you. And until then, we thank you. We look forward to the day that you glorify us and bring us to you. And until then, we want to serve you, honor you, and glorify you in all that we do and say. In your name we pray. Amen.